second lecture. Today we have a slightly uh, smaller audience, so I will be able to communicate more information and look at that. My computer is already saying I should take a break, <laughs> even though I have barely done anything. And this always happens to me, I always forget to switch the switch off the time out before holding a lecture. You have to suffer until it's there. Anyhow, so last time I talked about some tiny bit of convex analysis, optimality, duality, and initial ideas about first order methods. I have changed the outline slightly to actually match the, yeah, well, I think if you make it too dark, people may sleep. <laughs> okay. Usually it's good to have awake people. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's perfectly readable, right? Anyhow, so uh, uh, I will upload my previous slides. I'll, uh, the all three lecture slides will be online. And today, I'm the way I've structured the slides today, I decided to keep more stuff in than I'm going to speak. The reason is the slides essentially contain a couple of complete proofs, but very elementary proofs that anybody who's not gone through those before can verify that. And the proofs are really worth going through once, and hence uh, I left them on the slides. I may go through one of those just so that you get a feel for it if you haven't seen that before, but uh, they're fairly self-explanatory, and uh, I encourage you, if you're interested to just once you get your hands dirty with analysis of some simple optimization methods, go through a couple of those proofs. And I decided to omit talking about parallel and distributed algorithms. The methods that I will talk about, they are typically, at least in the industry, or even in general practice, often implemented in parallel and distributed settings, but the analysis there requires talking about several other things, uh, which I d decided to skip for today. But be assured, like all the methods that I talk about, they are favored because of their great simplicity, and one of the reasons of the simplicity is it makes it easier to implement them in large-scale settings. And Ironically, I'm going to talk about the simplest kind of optimization technology based around gradients, which is, as you may know, you know, currently the more popular way of solving large problems than the uh, theoretically popular wave of uh, interior point methods that existed in the 90s. And next final lecture, I will dedicate fully to talking about non-convex problems including examples where we can give theoretically strong statements, and it also including examples about what we actually just use, whether we can prove something strong or not, that's kind of open. Okay, so just as usual, I've sprinkled my slides with a couple of challenge problems, interesting directions for the interested people. I just wanted to mention to you uh, as I recap from last time, one of my favorite problems related to convex sets and volumes of convex sets, computing the volume of a convex set, the Lebesgue volume, is typically computationally intractable. So it's a very big and interesting topic o o on its own. But here is a classical problem from convex geometry is regarding the volumes of convex sets. And I'm not going to discuss it. This is here one of those nice challenge problems. So corresponding to each convex set, let's say it's a closed convex set, in fact, uh, we, you can associate a dual set, which is called polar. And related to that, there's a very nice question from Kurt Mahler from 1939. You take a convex set, you define its volume. This is just the it's called, yeah, this is just the Lebesgue volume. The Mahler volume is the product of the volume of the convex set 
with that of its polar. So if the set is a ball, so if it's like a unit norm Euclidean ball, then its dual set is itself. More generally, if it's an R sphere, its dual is 1 by R sphere. So this is like if you have x transpose ax as defining the convex set, the polar will involve x transpose a inverse x, roughly speaking. And the product volume is called the Mahler volume. Getting an upper bound on that, proving that this volume is maximized over the set of all closed, compact, symmetric, convex bodies centered at the origin. That's a theorem called the blaschke santana theorem. People use it in probability. That's an upper bound on that. Proving a lower bound on that has been an open problem since 1939. People in probability theory worry about such things. Maybe in number theory they worry about such things. It's just a very nice geometric problem. It's actually an optimization problem. We are optimizing over all possible closed convex sets. So it is a different kind of optimization problems from the ones we saw last time. But I wanted to bring this to your attention. The slides are clickable. Terry Tao has a nice little blog entry discussing this uh, uh, problem and how to easily construct an upper bound. OK, that was the, uh, I began with a digression, but I couldn't resist it. This is material related to last time. Just to uh, remind you something that we skipped. I had talked about gradient descent, and I had insisted that uh, in machine learning, at least we look at minimizing typically functions whose gradients are Lipschitz continuous. So that assumption is, it records throughout, at least whenever I talk about differentiable optimization. And regarding that, one of the most common, the, the, the mo one of the most important consequences of that is this upper bound, which does not depend on convexity. Using this upper bound, one can prove how fast does a gradient descent procedure converge, non-asymptotically that after k steps, how far it has gone. And proving these types of theorems has been very popular in machine learning and optimization for many years. In machine learning, it became kind of more popular around 2004 or 2007. And uh, I left this thing here. I typically call this the descent lemma. And the reason is, it says if you do gradient descent, so if you do gradient descent and you, uh, gra gradient descent, if you remember, is just x minus alpha times the gradient. So if instead of alpha, you plug in 1 divided by L. So if you minimize this upper bound, essentially, you get the so-called gradient descent update. You can just differentiate this uh, with respect to it. y, sorry, with respect to x. and if you plug that upper bound in, you, one can sh you can show by that simple algebra by using that descent lemma. I actually talked about this briefly last time, that actually gradient descent update for these Lipschitz continuous gradients, that means gradients don't fluctuate very crazily when you move from one point to the other in space, actually leads to decrease in objective function value. And proof of convergence of how fast you go towards an optimum, or the n or the optimum here in convex case, or, or just a stationary point in the non-convex case, then depends on being able to not only say that you descend, but by how much you descend at each step. And once you can count that, add things up, then you will be able to say after k steps, this is how close I've come to the optimum. That's pretty much the simplistic, natural way to analyze how these things work. OK, so I just left that here, and I, didn't, uh, and I didn't mention this last time, but I'll briefly mention this here. The proof of this thing is actually in lecture one, slides not done in the lecture, is uh, a very important topic, which you may have uh, seen also in Francis Bach's uh, lectures, is that for many of these optimization problems, Often, there are uh, different categories of assumptions we make when trying to analyze how good our methods are. So for example, to simplify our analysis, we assume our function is convex. To further simplify it, we say, well, let's assume it's differentiable. 
to make life even simpler, we say, well, it's differentiable with Lipschitz continuous gradient. So with, as you restrict the set of functions that you're minimizing, you can make stronger and potentially stronger and stronger statements. And opposite to people in numerical analysis, uh, for convex analysis uh, optimization, well, gradient descent converges at the rate 1 by k. This is sublinear convergence. And people celebrate if you can converge faster than 1 by k. That means in k steps, you are closer than order 1 by k to the optimum. And so they search, that's why, for an even smaller and interesting class of functions where you can converge faster than the sublinear rate. And one of those classes, it's not the only one, one of those classes is the class of uh, so-called strongly convex functions, which basically means that the Hessian of this thing has smallest eigenvalue bigger than or equal to mu, which means it has enough curvature. And if the thing is sharply enough curved or it gra its gradient, the rate at which its gradient changes is at least lower bounded by omega, that mu, one can exploit that to design optimized gradient descent like schemes, including gradient descent, which more aggressively optimize the cost function and can bring you close to a minimum at geometric rate, which is also known as linear convergence. Some people uh, like to call it exponential convergence. Annoyingly, there are th three or four different names for the same thing. Linear convergence, geometric convergence, exponential convergence. And depending on what level of marketer, salesperson you are, you may use those different words. But uh, typically, uh, in machine learning, people just call it linear convergence. Geometric is also OK, because that tells you that if I have at least this much curvature, at each step, I take a certain fraction. I make a guaranteed fraction of progress. And that's the ratio of your geometric series. That's why it's geometric convergence. So that type of, you may have that type of convergence theorem, that after k steps, for lip, uh, strongly convex with Lipschitz continuous gradient, you are within that much of the, uh, the optimum. And this is actually a remarkably short three-line proof, which is in the slides of lecture one, which I should upload. So. If you haven't seen that super short proof before, it's uh, good to see. Well, it's uh, th three line short because it uses a five line lemma as a subroutine. But uh, it's worth looking at. And the, the, the proof of this stuff is on slides from last time. So now I'll uh, step away from differentiable problems and talk a little bit about non-differentiable problems. And here is where maybe an optimization person may diverge from, say, somebody just cares about pure mathematics in the sense that convex functions are almost everywhere differentiable. If they are non-differentiable, this number of non-differentiable points is just a set of measure zero. So the Pure math guy says, well, whatever, you know, uh, this set doesn't matter. You may say a similar thing. This is a famous theorem from Alexandra from 1930s that uh, it's almost everywhere essentially also twice differentiable, modulo one or two small conditions. But as we know from optimization and applied uh, questions that arise in compressed sensing, statistics, etc. It's exactly these non-differentiable points that we are chasing. So we cannot really afford to ignore them. The interesting stuff happens at this. Because these non-differentiable points where the function is non-differentiable may correspond to where your solution is sparse or something, or has some other geometric structure that you care for. So you really actually do care about exactly that set. And in the world of convex analysis, fortunately, as I mentioned also last time, we have a nice analog of differential calculus, which is the sub-differential calculus. And we have very similar calculus rules, like chain rule, addition rule, etc. Module, of course, always in quote marks. 
and which is why uh, you may think that well okay we've been doing gradient descent since at least Cauchy so uh, now that we finally figured out that gradients can be replaced by subgradients can we do the same type of thing and indeed if f is non differentiable but say you can pull subgradients can you just run that iteration it's something that something one may naively try but it's it was found to be an audacious idea when I think Norm Shore introduced it in uh, the Soviet Union back in the day, maybe 60s, late 60s or so. People said, what the heck, this thing is not differentiable, what, what is this scheme that you are trying to run? And he then analyzed and showed that actually this scheme may work, but it differs remarkably from gradient descent. It looks algebraically sim similar. If you implement it in MATLAB, it will also look pretty much the same, but it differs a lot in certain aspects. And I will qu quickly comment on those aspects in the coming slides. And the questions here we wish to answer are, uh, I already talked about those, that if you run this iteration starting from wh whatever, it generates a sequence of vectors. Does that sequence converge? If not, uh, if it converges, how fast? And typically, though, actually, it's easier to bound not the sequence of x k's, but rather the sequence of objective function values. And in machine learning problems, we are almost always satisfied with trying to bound this. We often may ignore the sequence of x k's because we place a lot of faith into the cost function that we design and doing a good job on minimizing or reducing this cost function suffices for us. This has another reason that often optimization problems we solve them on noisy incomplete data. So anyways the x k which may come out may not be the uh, so uh, like its components may not have such deep meaning so as to say but anyhow here is a toy example i implemented this in matlab maybe two lines as you can see pretty much i implemented that line in matlab so can you this is your uh, lasso style problem solve it using subgradient method now you notice what it looks like. So this is a remarkable departure because I didn't yet talk about how to choose these alphas. For gradient descent I just put alpha equal to 1 by L where L was the Lipschitz constant of the gradient. Here we don't have gradient, we don't have this Lipschitz stuff and what happens is when you implement it, this is the one of the things which made people question now I'm sure when he suggested the method that hey this method uh, doesn't decrease anything monotonically it just fluctuates like crazy how are you going to prove convergence and this is the, uh, I, I belabored this point also a bit last time that well it's not always necessary to ensure strict monotonic descent breaking the shackles of strict monotonicity can help us come up with uh, maybe simpler faster methods and subgradient method is one such method actually and so what it means is okay the grade, the direction that you use with the subgradient is not leading to monotonic decrease even if you were to pick the best possible step size etc so what do you do so that means when we analyze these methods the to ensure that they are well behaved a slightly different kind of uh, convergence analysis is typically needed anyhow so uh, the stuff is very sensitive to good choice of alpha so i implemented it with slightly better alpha and i got some what different looking plot but even with very good alphas i still had non monotonic behavior it's 
worth implementing this lasso solver in one line of MATLAB to get a feel for the subgradient method. And if you are ever faced with a tricky looking or non tricky looking optimization problem, typically nobody, uh, this method is not recommended for solving problems, but it is a baseline that you should always try to exceed. I have had to review papers in the past for optimization journals where the author writes 20 page long complicated method, then I run their code and I compare it with the humble little subgradient method and lo and behold the subgradient method works as well or even better because getting subgradients is typically much cheaper. So something is amiss, right? So, so sometimes one gets misled by just the power of analysis, but it's always worth checking with your computer that does this seem to work okay? Because there are many other factors that make this problem work or not work in reality, right? This A operator, computing AX may be actually the bottleneck, not something else and so on. Anyhow, so to a few remarks about step size of subgradient methods including a very interesting uh, observation not my observation, classical observation in subgradient methods. Constant step size idea does not really work in subgradient methods. So, in gradient descent we used alpha is equal to 1 by L. We could use a constant step size. For subgradient methods using a constant step size does not really work. Here is an example kind of hand wavy proof of why constant step sizes may blow up on you. So, if you were to use step sizes, well this is not really con uh, constant, this is like I call it a scaled constant. So, if you were to use some constant divided by the norm of the gradient, subgradient of the subgradient that you are using. So, here we are using the iteration, we are using x k minus alpha k subgradient, it is any subgradient, okay. That is why I said last time determining the full sub differential is hard, but all we typically care for algorithms is a single sub gradient. Now, plug in that alpha, some constant divided by norm of the gradient and what do you see? That after the update, the subsequent iterates are always at least alpha apart, not at least exactly alpha apart, always. So, this shows that uh, this type of scheme cannot really converge. So, in subgradient methods, playing around with steps is important so, and people typically use this classical stuff from real analysis. Uh, we almost always end up having to use step sizes that shrink to 0 to basically kill out these oscillations that come from using subgradients. But you do not want to kill them out too fast, otherwise you may stop too early. So, you may converge to the wrong thing. That is why we also want this to be non-summable. So, the sequence 1 by k is one of the most famous sequences that shows up when analyzing subgradient methods because that satisfies that or you may also have 1 by square root k. So, things like that, but it is important to remember people may, some people call it subgradient descent. Oh yeah, sorry, it, it will not. You add an epsilon. Uh, so, it is not a descent method that is important to remember. Some people call it subgradient descent because we say gradient descent, then we just replace gradient by subgradient. It is descent, but sort of just like stochastic gradient descent that I will talk about soon. Anyhow, so here is uh, the dismal news on subgradient method toy example, single variable optimization problem. We are minimizing the absolute value of x for x belongs to r. The answer is obvious to everybody what the minimum is, but let us try to run a subgradient method on it nevertheless. Just analyze the sequence generated by that iteration. So, the absolute value function is uh, we, we saw last time what its sub differential looks like, right? If x is positive, it is differentiable and the gradient is plus 1. 
x is negative gradient is minus 1, at 0 it is the entire real interval minus 1 to 1 and you can pick anything from there. So, you run that, do this toy calculation and use that step size, it is an extra exercise to show that that is the optimal step. You plug that in and you see that the sequence generated by the sub gradient method, this sequence goes down at that speed. So, after k steps, you have reached order of 1 by square root k, close to the optimum, which means if you want to come to a distance of epsilon to the optimum, you need order of 1 by epsilon square steps of the subgradient method, which means you need to compute 1 by epsilon square subgradients. So, you can now quickly guesstimate the running time of your algorithm. And even though this is a toy example one dimensional where you already know the answer, this is pretty much the typical convergence behavior of subgradient method in R n. And actually, I will uh, flash that slide later, but the subgradient method is pretty much the best you can do for non-smooth problems. So, not too much good news for today morning, maybe you already knew that. So, I am going to skip this convergence analysis of the subgradient method in the interest of time, but this is the first sequence of convergence analysis that I have kept in the slides for your reference, but I will comment on basically the key idea here. One makes, we, we, we make some assumptions, uh, these can be made in hindsight after trying to do the math and seeing ah, what makes my inequalities hold or I can give them some uh, fancy explanation like uh, we want, uh, this is reasonable, our domain is bounded. So, th that one we can assume that the subgradients do not fluctuate so crazily, so we assume they are upper bounded, that is a very strong kind of assumption and that the minimum is actually attained, that is not an inf, the minimum is actually attained. And these are kind of standard assumptions. And we try to, because it is not a strictly decree monotonic method, it is easier to show convergence results for collecting the smallest objective function value seen up till k iterations, rather than the instantaneous value f of k, the minimum f of k is seen so far. So, that when you had that graph, you are just taking the lower envelope of it. So it is just easier to prove inequalities for that. So, the key idea is uh, in throughout all, and you may have seen this uh, previously also, throughout the analysis of these first order methods, sometimes you uh, have to be clever to design this, sometimes you can just try the obvious thing, is to come up with some function that you can use to judge progress of your method. This is uh, in, in, a, in honor of Lyapunov from control systems. It is called a Lyapunov function and sometimes it takes, uh, I am not going to uh, go through the analysis of those, but some uh, those methods, but sometimes it takes a fair bit of effort and creativity to come up with the right kind of Lyapunov function with which to measure progress of your method. So, it is not always obvious, but in, yeah, and uh, in, in some cases, one can do away with the cleverness needed to construct Lyapunov functions, but solve a 2 by 2 semi definite program or something and use a computer to guess the Lyapunov function for you. But then if a, when, if a computer is guessing the function for you, then you miss out on actually understanding what is happening. So, one of the most classical Lyapunov functions is really just this obvious one. We measure even though the cost function is not going down monotonically, we measure after k steps our distance to x star, an optimal point. And we just try to see how this thing evolves as a function of k. So, you just plug in the subgradient update, just expand that and now you see some of uh, the convenient assumptions that we had. The first one is of course, convexity, 
convexity allows me to replace this term by term involving f. I just use this definition of subgradients. That's the definition of convexity. So that allows me to come from here to here. And you can now unroll this all the way down to k0. So I get this kind of inductive term in there, right? So, so far really nothing has been done, just definitions have been used. But the most creative thing here was to come up with that criterion. After that it is just algebra. And now use our convenient assumptions to simplify what this difficult looking term looks like. So that we can throw it away and replace it by a constant. So that is where the so that is why I said you could almost reverse engineer why those assumptions arise is they simplify your life. So I will uh, I'll skip some of those details. This is very simple algebra, but the bottom line is by plugging in those assumptions on, uh, so, so okay, let me just comment. This part we assume is upper bounded by r because our domain is bounded, r square. This part is upper bounded by summation of alpha t square, mm, upper bound on the subgradients. And because we keep track of just the minima, we can replace the fts by the best possible f at the, the, until that point. And that allows us to basically ditch all the non-constant looking terms. And you have that kind of bound. We just rearrange that. So you say, after k steps, the best f value you have seen, how far is it from f star? That is upper bounded by this quantity. So if you see, up to a couple of assumptions, this is a pretty much as simple a proof of convergence as you can get. And, but this is also one of the most important proofs. Any generalization of subgradient, stochastic subgradient, God knows what not subgradient you study ends up having this type of structure. So now, so, I mean, you require that the alpha t squares. So far, I haven't required anything on them. Yeah. Okay. They're just non-negative numbers. Sure, sure. Yeah. That's, uh, but I said, I sh already showed you one dimensional subgradient method. You don't expect good stuff from it, but uh, the subgradient, I will comment on that, but I will already say this in advance. The subgradient method is minimax optimal. So the non smooth convex functions, if you try to minimize them using any method, that has access to first order information about the cost function. No method can do better than, under some uh, simple assumptions, better than subgradient method. So it sucks, but it's the best. So we have to, we'll, we'll try to overcome that. But the interesting thing is, these are the types of questions we are interested in. That we want to come epsilon close to an optimum. How many iterations should we run our method for so that we are epsilon close? And this is the kind of question we are interested in answering throughout. For gradient descent, we said we want to come within an epsilon distance of an optimum. For strongly convex, the optimum. How many times do I need to run? How many iterations do I need to run? Same thing here. How many iterations do I need to run to come epsilon close to an optimum? Well, we just showed it. We want f star, f k minus f star to be smaller than epsilon. We sandwich this upper bound in between. And now you just minimize this upper bound as a function of alpha. It's an interesting exercise to minimize that. Do you see that this is a convex function of alpha? It looks like a ratio of quadratic to linear, so it's not obviously convex, but it is a convex function. 
So that's, uh, that itself is a short exercise worth proving. Uh, actually, in slides of lecture one, there is a hint on the wave one. Um, means you can just take second derivative if you want, for example. But anyhow, so you can minimize this as a function of alpha, and it turns out because it's a symmetric polynomial, uh, not polynomial ratio, it's a symmetric function in alpha, the best alpha is actually a constant because of that. A symmetric convex function is minimized always at a symmetric solution. So that turns out to be alpha. This is a non pseudo trivial, non trivial theorem, uh, but it's a good one to know. Uh, so, best constant is alpha, and you end up getting that alpha should be something divided by square root of k. And this has shown us that using the geometrical properties of our cost function, x0, x star is upper bounded by r, how badly how rapidly the gradient grows using those constants, so called constants. Okay, this is the fraud part here. Uh, you can optimize this bound to get the best possible alpha, plug that in, and you have some guarantee. And this means it will take uh, 1 by epsilon square steps. The difficult thing about this, which only the people who implement this complain about, is in reality, I never know those constants r and g. Getting one of those constants may be harder than solving the original problem. But that's a common trick, you know, like I said last time. Sometimes when we don't uh, have full control on a quantity, we give it a new name, a uh, nice look sounding name. This is the expansion constant or so something like that. And then you can uh, put, uh, put that, sweep that under the rug. So it's, when you implement this, it's important. Uh, and typically, what you may still be able to get are some crude bounds on these constants, which is why a real system that would implement these methods has to work much harder to numerically guess these constants, to numerically bound them, or to do a line search, backtrack, whatnot. A lot of extra hard work is needed, even for this so-called simple method to make it actually work. But in the end, if we knew the best constants, this is the speed at which it progresses. Okay. The other thing is the original state of k. Yes, so here I, here I said I know k in advance. If you don't know k in advance, then you can set the step alpha k. So if you don't know the total number of iterations in advance, you can set it proportion to, proportional to 1 by square root of the current iteration then you incur slight additional uh, logarithmic additional error, but uh, it still works. So this is for simplification, yeah. So here is there are a couple of exercises littered throughout for uh, the interested people. Classical machine learning optimization problem support vector machine. It's written like that. You can try to derive a subgradient method for that. And lo and behold, if you knew the constants, here you can. You can write a support vector machine solver again in two lines of MATLAB. So there was a time when people published papers about solving this using subgradient style method as the next fancy scalable method, etc. But those uh, simple days are gone, unfortunately. Uh, but it's it's a great exercise to try out. This is one of my favorite problems. Uh, in fact, one of the oldest optimization problems called the Fermat-Weber point problem also known as geometric median problem, that you have, let's just say, I just collected, I have vectors A1 through An. I just put them as columns of that matrix A. And I want to find a point X close to all of those. So if, so the reason it's called geometric median is, suppose, the matrix A were 1 by n, then this norm and that P is equal to 1. Suppose P is equal to 1, so this is just x is a scalar and you have n different scalars. Try to minimize that for scalars. And the answer, you can derive the answer in various ways. To me, the simplest answer is again by 
writing 0 belongs to the sub differential. So, if you minimize that problem, the answer is given by the median, which is why more generally this problem in arbitrary normed vector space, this can be an infinite dimensional if you want, it is called the geometric median problem. It becomes fairly non trivial to solve, and some aspects of this problem to get good methods for that were are not yet fully understood, surprisingly. And you can see the benefit of subgradient by trying to program that in CVX and writing your own subgradient method and seeing which method which uh, software wins. It is pretty nice exercise. And the third one I will skip over. This is somewhat impractical, but this says if you knew the actual value at the optimum, you could use that to come up with somewhat fancier choices of step sizes. So, I leave this as an exercise to show that even with this choice, we get the so called uh, 1 by epsilon square convergence. So, this is a third exercise. And there are various other varieties of step size choices that can be exercises. And here is the theorem, the promise theorem that I alluded to previously, that the subgradient method is doing the best you can anyways do. So, it's a classical result from Nemirovsky and Udin. Most of the work was in Nemirovsky's PhD thesis in 1979. Uh, and then a simplified, uh, more accessible presentation is in Yuri Nesterov's book on convex optimization, which pretty much says that for non-smooth functions, we are, if you are trying to optimize them using a subgradient method, then no matter what method you use. So, if you are trying to optimize using subgradients, not using the subgradient method, you may ask that, okay, I just did x k plus 1 is x k minus alpha times subgradient. What if I was doing something more fancy with the subgradients? So, there is a lower bound that no matter how you use the subgradients, you have to take 1 by square root k steps. So, subgradient method achieves 1 by square root k. So, the lower bound essentially matches the upper bound up to constants. So, it is pretty much the best we can do. Exactly. So, it is the worst case result. Yeah, there may be functions for which you can do better. And the, it's the search of these functions which has driven a lot of interest in optimization over the past many years. And this is the case for ev every time we meet a lower bound, a good question to ask is exactly what Holger said. Can we identify an interesting slash useful class of functions which do not suffer this lower bound? So, the answer is I have already mentioned. And the answer is simple in hindsight. Okay, It was a remarkable recognition by Yuri Nesterov to recognize this class of functions. It is one of those classes, but things look always simpler in hindsight, but this was one of his many breakthroughs. And that is, we look at this class of problems, uh, fx plus rx, where f is smooth, r is non-smooth. This is like your lasso or what is some kind of compressed sensing uh, problems, uh, optimization versions or logistic regression and many other such sparsity problems. There are like hundreds of such problems. Uh, machine learning is also full of many of these. They are of the format loss plus regularizer. And if you were to use a subgradient method to minimize these, it would look like that. And we saw that it converges very slowly. But f has some more structure. It is not just an arbitrary non-smooth function. It has a smooth part and a non-smooth part. Can we exploit the smoothness of the smooth, smooth part somehow? In some cases, we can. And that is the cool realization. And by exploiting that uh, what we mean is that we want to potentially exploit the smoothness of the smooth part to be able to converge faster than 1 by square root k. That is the aim here. Because you remember, if you recall, gradient descent, which uses smoothness, converges as 1 by k. 
So to remind you, uh, maybe you have seen projected gradient descent at some point. So if you were doing gradient descent on F, but actually you had a constrained problem, not an unconstrained problem, you could just do the gradient update and then do an orthogonal projection onto the constraint set. And hopefully you've seen it. If you haven't seen this iteration, it's one of the basic optimization methods to remember. Because one of the remarkable things about this gradient projection or projected gradient method is, it pretty much always works. And what I mean by that is, even if you're doing optimization in discrete spaces and X is a discrete set or X is a non-convex set, even on, in those trickier cases, this type of iteration very frequently works. Is it, by works means you have to invest some effort to analyze those harder cases, but this type of iteration pretty much is always worth trying when designing an optimization procedure. This is exactly orthogonal to the advice given in optimization textbooks from maybe 15 years ago who say, oh, gradient descent is simple method, it sucks, so don't use it. Only naive people use it. But these days, uh, all of us uh, use it. And related, closely related to gradient descent is something called proximal gradient method, which I will describe now. And uh, I'll describe all these terms. I just wrote those together to say that you do a gradient step and you do some projection to handle the constraint. Proximal gradient, you do a gradient step and you do something to handle the non-differentiability. So that's kind of the inspiration where this is coming from. Let me make this explicit, actually. So orthogonal projection onto a set using our notation of indicator functions can be written as that optimization problem, right? This is just orthogonal projection rewritten to be unconstrained. Where if you remember, the indicator function is zero if x, if this x is in that constraint set, otherwise it's plus infinity. That's a convex function. And this is, the solution of this is called the projection. And the map that takes y into the solution is called a projection operator. This is classical stuff also from uh, linear algebra. All we've done is we've replaced a subspace or hyperplane by a general convex set. That's all that has happened here. So a lot of the linear algebraic intuition still continues to hold. Now, this is a clever idea of, uh, I think it's to be credited to Jean-Joseph Moreau from in 1962, he wrote a paper on that. Uh, most, he's credited with that idea. That we take that, you replace that indicator function with some other convex function. So we started with this projection problem, replace the indicator function by some other convex function. The solution to that is called proximity operator. And the reason it's called proximity is you try to find a point which is close to x. So you're trying, sorry, which is close to y. So you're proximal to y. If you have good uh, visualization ability and you can visualize this, then uh, please feel free to share your visualization with me. Uh, I, I just think about it algebraically because it's written algebraically here, but maybe somebody has a uh, nice geometric picture. Uh, I haven't seen so far any nice, actually clear-cut geometric uh, explanation of this object, because for you, I just derived it here uh, algebraically. And use, the use of proximity operators was already there being done by people in signal processing. And even before that, in convex analysis by Rockefeller in the 70s. But after Yuri Nesterov's paper, which showed that you can actually, for 
f x plus r x problems, where the proximity operator is actually computable efficiently, right? Is this had better be efficiently computable? You can actually avoid the worst case that subgradient method suffers. So that breakthrough kind of result made this very popular in machine learning and also for people doing plug and play with L1 norm. Here's why. Hopefully you have seen this before. If not, here it is. So this is, uh, if R of X is just the L1 norm, the prox operator is the solution to that simple separable optimization problem, which is so separable it breaks into N sub problems. And solution of that is known as the soft thresholding operator. Certainly you have seen this few times. Wow, another break. Maybe I'll give you a break on the next slide. This exercise is worth doing, OK? If you never spent time deriving any prox operators, at least spend time deriving this one. It's very useful. The next thing I'm leaving as, uh, OK, this is uh, an exercise. I want you to bring to your attention this challenge. And the reason I'm placing this challenge is here is to tell you that fine, we wanted to get theoretical benefits from smoothness by handling the non-smoothness through proximity operators. But in some sense, we have just shifted the burden. The proximity operator has to be implemented by somebody. Either you download a library, or if you have a new non-smooth non function, you may have to derive a proximity operator. That means derive an algorithm that computes that subroutine, that, that, that solves that subproblem. And solving that subproblem efficiently may be pretty tricky. So here is a, here are two challenges. If x is the infinity norm, if you were to derive a deterministic worst case linear time method where by that n is the dimensionality of x, this particular problem is just a disguised version of a problem for which throughout optimization I have many, uh, now by now seen at least uh, 15 people rediscovering and claiming that they have a better method or claiming they have a new way to do it in O of n. This is one of the most classically solved proximity operators since the 50s under different names. It's worth trying to see how close to O of n you can get. O of n log n is fairly, I, I shouldn't say super easy, but O of n log n is doable. O of n is somewhat harder. Randomized O of n is much easier. Deterministic O of n is harder. But just saying that this simple harmless looking thing is actually non-trivial. So uh, Moro's identity is an exercise. If you use it, uh, then what? Then that means then you have to. No, no. I'm saying so. If you know that. No, it's a, just a challenge open because it is follows the exercise on Moro decomposition. Yeah. Then you can do projection onto the L1 ball. Projection onto L1 ball is, a, is this problem that has been solved 50 times. So getting O of n time method to project onto the L1 ball suffices to solve this problem because L1 is, is the dual norm to L infinity. But getting an O of n method is not easy. I once by mistake gave this on uh, an exam, but they had uh, two days take home time. So and then I re removed the O of n requirement by O of n square. So it means because it was my bad. An even trickier problem, which people from image processing will know, is using the so-called anisotropic or L1 norm total variation. Its corresponding proximity operator 
You can actually do it in O of n time. I learned of that only in maybe 2012. Previously, I wasn't aware of any deterministic or non-deterministic finite time method to do this. So, uh, this is also one of the most uh, well-solved total uh, proximity operators. There are at least, I think, at least 25 to 35 papers and different methods. But the best you can do is O of n. Of course, that's the time it takes to read the data. Uh, but if you're interested, you, you can get a feel for uh, doing these. And I don't know if Francis talked anything about submodular optimization, discrete optimization using convex relaxation in his talk, but these types of things are also subroutines for several discrete optimization problems. So it's good to uh, have a feel for some of these basic building blocks. And to me, the reason I'm stressing so much, for people who use the LAPAC libraries to support, or, and the BLAST libraries to support numerical linear algebra, many times a single function in LAPAC is the result of several different PhD theses, or of at least one PhD thesis. Some of these PROX operators, they are like the BLAST and LAPAC of convex optimization, and doing a good job on them uh, can have substantial uh, value. So it's, th th that's why they, these are very well studied. Anyhow, and I just left an exploratory problem. This will, uh, yeah. No, it was a re regularized problem, so there was no constraint set. So if the, well, the, the, these are different choices of R's. So this one corresponds to having an L1 norm ball as a constraint. So if you want your vectors to live in L1 norm ball of size lambda, then this is the corresponding optimization problem. And this I left as exploration. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it right now. but. Proximity is not a concept limited to Euclidean space, and people have explored the idea of proximity. Just because you have explore, people have explored projections in different metric spaces, orthogonal projection in inner product space, some other distance-based projection in some other metric space. So similarly you can define proximity operators in other metric spaces. And to, uh, next time when I talk about uh, geometric optimization, I'll give you an example of a proximity operator which is not defined in Euclidean space but is defined on a manifold. Some proximity operators which are defined for LP norm vector spaces, those lead to uh, and they need not actually always be defined over metric spaces. You could have something else in there which behaves like a metric. And that leads to what is called mirror descent, if you've heard the term. Anyhow, so that's uh, my story about prox operators. The most important thing I want to tell you here, and I always slow down too much, but I think this, is, this has been by far one of the most uh, important uh, things for large scale machine learning, but where is it coming from? An alternative derivation of uh, the proximal gradient method. So I talk about proximity operators because I was trying to solve fx plus h of x by doing gradient descent and wrapping it around, wrapping around it a proximity operator. But why am I doing that other than just generalization for the sake of generalization or it just seemed natural? Here is one derivation. I'll come to this derivation once again, and then you'll understand it even more. So remember, last time also I belabored this point that when we have at least a convex optimization problem, you write down its optimality condition, 
the optimality condition is a bunch of nonlinear equations and you can try to solve this nonlinear equation somehow. So, you go back to classical functional analysis, you say okay, I have some nonlinear, linear or nonlinear map, I can try to find fixed points of that map. We do not even need to think about in those terms, but for those of you who know uh, some of these terms, that, that may help make a connection. But the bottom line being, I start trying to minimize f of x, I write down its optimality conditions and I try to find a point that satisfies the optimality conditions. That is all I am trying to do. And different family of algorithms that we have talked about, all of those are trying to do the same thing. So, here if you are trying to minimize that, let us try to see one way where the proxim proximal gradient method comes. So, you, this one you agree, Fermat's theorem from 1630, some number like that, that 0 has to belong to the sub differential. F is differentiable, so its sub gradient, sub differential is just the gradient. This is Minkowski sum, so 0 belongs to this set, is a necessary condition of optimality. For convex functions, this condition is also sufficient. For non-convex functions, it is just necessary. Now, I scale both sides by alpha. So far, so good. I am just playing with symbols here. I add x to both sides. So, an optimal x star had better satisfy that inclusion. Now, you can see the beginnings of what may happen next. So, I take the vectors to this side. So, x star minus alpha f belongs to this set. Now, if I could somehow invert that operator. So, this is the, this operator identity plus sub differential. If I could invert that, then I could write this nonlinear fixed point equation. And this inversion, I will come to it shortly, is what is called prox. So, that is like a derivation from first principles that you can always try to create such derivations if you think in terms of fixed points. You can also derive gradient descent and projected gradient descent like that by just writing the optimality condition, throwing in few symbols, rearranging, writing a fixed point equation and then, then comes the hard part. I wrote the fixed point iteration, so it suggests that well I may actually iterate it. I wrote the fixed point equation, I may turn that into an iteration only if I manage to show that turning it into this iteration is actually a well defined thing that this iteration actually converges. So, that is where the hard part lies. Coming up with a potential fixed point equation is not so hard, but it is one of the interesting things in there. And why it works? I am not going to talk about it, but I have a very short proof in there of the proximal gradient method and that proof more or less mimics the proof of gradient descent. And that it is just somehow carefully handles the contribution from the prox operator. And out of the many proofs, I find, find this proof uh, one of the most accessible. So, I put it on my slides, but now I am going to skip it and leave it on the slides for those who are interested in looking at a proof of proximal gradient method. And once again means it, it centers around our friend the descent lemma and showing that there is enough descent happening and coming up with the usual Lyapunov function etcetera. But when my slides are up, I encourage you to go through this proof. It is really very easy algebra, but it will exercise uh, your convex abilities. And you end up showing that like gradient descent, proximal gradient also converges at the 1 by k rate. But actually, this rate, even though it is faster than subgradient, 
it is not yet the best possible. And guess again, who was the person to come up with the best possible rate? It was again uh, Yuri Nesrov in brilliant creative work. Now, there's several different ways to derive that, but the original idea is usually one of the coolest, is that there are faster methods. So, just to remind you, gradient descent converges at linear rate for Lipschitz, continuous gradient for strongly convex, sorry, it converges at this 1 by k sublinear, linear rate for strongly convex. And these are lower bounds from Nestor's book that actually uh, for smooth functions, in you have to spend at least 1 by k square. And for strongly convex functions, the dependence on L and mu is not like L and mu, it is like square root of L and square root of mu. Which means, here the dependence on the condition number is linear, here you depend on only the square root of the condition number. So, there is a big gap for ill conditioned problems which can mean something. And for a long time, people in optimization struggled to discover methods which match the lower bounds. So, the breakthrough was in 1983 paper by Yuri Nesterov, where he came up with a clever scheme to what is known as accelerated gradient to make it meet, meet the lower bound. There have been many variations of that idea by now. And in the past two years, there have been at least four papers, each claiming to have the geometric, intuitive, the best, the simplest explanation of why it works. But uh, of course, uh, th those are biased opinions from authors. But it, it's uh, it's pretty cool thing to know. And one of the breakthroughs was the simple idea, which I mentioned last time, that, that that's what Yuri said, that one of the ways of overcoming the 1 by k for gradient descent was to stop thinking in terms of monotonic descent. So, breaking some of those fixed ways of thinking uh, does lead to progress. And there is some more, but anyhow, so, uh, for subgradient method, we already showed that it is optimal, and we say, and the important thing to rem remember about methods like proximal gradient is that whenever you can actually assume that you can compute the prox operator, it translates the faster convergence rates, including the optimal 1 by k square and the optimal linear rate of smooth problems also to the non-smooth problem where you have access to a proximity operator. So, that is one of the reasons why these things are and were very popular. And I will just mention here, there are several different analyses. There is a very nice paper by Paul Tseng from 2008, who to, at least to me gives one of the most accessible convergence analyses of these schemes. So, if you are interested, if you ever find yourself needing to prove theorems about such schemes, uh, Paul Seng's 2008 paper is one of the best places to go to. Okay. And now, I will just uh, come back to speak a little bit more about the prox operators by actually using operator language so that I can show you another cool fixed point trick and stoke your imagination for discovering your own fixed point tricks, which can be then maybe turned into algorithms if you are lucky. So, the operator view is just this. You can think of the sub differential operator as a multi valued map. It maps x into that set. So, you can write that. Uh, so, this is like kind of notation that uh, we can talk in terms of relations. These are subsets of R n cross R n. For example, the identity relation consists of x, which is the input, 
and x, that is the output. So, all the tuples x comma x. The sub differential has input x and the second and its output is all the sub gradients at point x. So, this big, so this set of tuples can be collected and we will just call it the sub differential relation. So, it is just a notation and here is the use of that notation. So, people have tried to generalize it, but uh, the most important kind of relation is really the sub differential relation, which is built on using the definition of the sub differential set. And the aim of most of optimization is, so r of x basically is this, this is the notation, we will write r of x to mean that. So, we have been doing this so far, I just said that, I just use this language of relations to maybe stoke your imagination that in some cases, you may be able to think of operators other than just this uh, sub differential, but typically uh, in most of the problems that I work on, that is the only thing there. But anyhow, so what you can say the goal of all of optimization algorithms is to solve this generalized equation. For differentiable problems, it is just a bunch of nonlinear equations, which back in the day and even now, people solve using Newton's method, sequence me sequent method and what not method and several other fixed point methods. For non-differentiable problems, you just replace that non-linear equation by this generalized equation. So, this some people call it an inclusion. So, you want to find a 0 in that set. I am just repeating myself uh, again and again that this is what we are trying to find. And the reason we use this notation is it just condenses uh, some of the things. So, the, one of the key properties is to look at operators that are monotone and And one of the in intuitive ways to think about like this type of monotonicity property, and this is all in reverse engineering in hindsight, is well, we saw that uh, for gradient method we could construct some kind of monotonic scheme. For subgradient method we could not, but things still work out. There is some other way to judge monotonicity that is hiding in there, which you try to pull out, roughly speaking. And here is an example. So, any set valued operator is called monotone, if it does the right thing, which means, uh, because this is generalizing the notion of monotonicity from scalars to vectors. So, you have to come up with the correct partial order, which will, set, which, which will help you judge monotonicity. So, for example, if A, if A is a positive semi-definite matrix, it satisfies this. This is the definition of semi-definiteness, right? I just wrote it differently, but this is what it means for A to be semi-definite. So, any positive semi-definite matrix helps you define monotonicity. The sub-differential of a convex function ends up satisfying that. And that monotonicity is uh, essentially equivalent to convexity, actually. So, it is a pretty strong result there. For real valued, not R n, but for real valued, it is you have a slightly bigger class. And our friends, the projection and proximity operators, they are also monotonic operators. And that is why, like, there is this general language talking in terms of operators looking at their common properties. So, when I talked about proximity, I showed projection, then I say, hey, this looks very, proximity is kind of similar to projection. There is m several other operators which look similar to these guys, and you go back to classical stuff from nonlinear functional analysis, where people study things like non-expensive operators, firmly non-expensive operators, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, this general operator language allows you to analyze a fairly large class of iterative algorithms, if you can write them in terms of a monotonic operator of some kind. So, projection is a monotonic operator, 
Using some of those properties, we could analyze, say, projected gradient descent. Proximal gradient descent is a monotonic operator. We can, and that is used in the proof. If you go through the proof, you'll see it's used, but I don't call, call out on it in the proof. And several other such, I'll show one more example, operators, they are this monotonic operators. And so once you discovered a proof technique for one, by thinking in terms of monotonic operators, you may be able to extend that proof technique to several other cases. So that's just the benefit of the generalization. So it's not a generalization for the sake of generalization. And uh, the key message, which I think I've been repeating from lecture one, is that this abstraction is motivated by people trying to see analogies between linear algebra and optimization or between convexity. And many of these iterations, like proximal gradient iteration and one that I'm about to write now, they were originally derived by people solving uh, PDEs after linearizing and writing some iteration with linear operators. So it's the, all, all, the original ideas are all coming from just uh, l uh, linear algebra. Okay, so uh, here is the here is the general purpose view of the operator language. We want to solve that generalized equation. And this is pretty much a tautological theorem by definition. Here's why. Well, 0 belongs to R of x. That's what we want to solve. You've seen this now before. You can fill in the blanks yourself. This generalized equation is replaced by that, by scaling by alpha. No, pro no problems. Then adding x to both sides, then assuming that uh, can be inverted, we define inversion the, the correct way because r was written as this tuple. So solution to that can be equivalently written like this. This is called the resolvent equation. And now this is actually that thing as a theorem that I previously just hand waved through that the inverse of that identity plus sub differential is actually what is called the prox operator. The proof is actually simple and forget that the proof is once again nothing but the optimality condition for the definition of the prox operator. So it is once again 0 belongs to sub differential in disguise always. So you can try to show that theorem by just looking at the definition of the prox operator. Differentiate with respect to x, you get x minus y plus lambda sub differential of h contains 0. Rearrange it the way I've done there and you will end up getting exactly that definition. So that's just the definition of the proximity operator in different notation. Let's use this notation and then I think I should wrap up so that you don't get too tired, is the second most important idea. One, well, it's, we've, we've already seen this idea, but second most important idea is that when we were trying to optimize fx plus r of x, we turned this uh, into gradients of f and prox operator of r. But suppose r is actually Okay, I'm confusing the notation here, but R is actually itself further decomposed into some of two, three, four, or ten different functions. Can I further leverage that decomposition? For example, in the so-called uh, fused lasso or elastic net, one of these is an L1 norm, the other is a total variation norm. So that's a common example where you have the sum of two terms. In the support vector machine that I showed you earlier, it's actually sum of n different non-smooth functions over n different training data points. So there are several instances of this sum of more than one non-smooth function that shows up, that show up. And here, directly using the proximal gradient method is not easy because 
it requires us to compute proximity operator of the sum f plus h. And computing the proximity operator of a sum of many different functions may be hard, because it itself is an optimization problem. Unless you manage to solve that optimization problem quickly, it is just rewriting notation. You cannot really implement this. So, this is my kind of standard example. This is prox operator for like two norm and total variation. You could even, you could make that one norm, then it is called fused lasso. Solving that prox operator uh, may, may not be so easy. And however, we do know that we have, if you have done the exercise, an O of n method to compute this, and O of n method to compute that prox operator of those guys separately. Can we benefit from that? Can we leverage that? So, this is like the bigger idea of variable splitting, operator splitting of which this ADMM etcetera is a special case, is to break this computation somehow. So, I will give you one example of how we break this computation by thinking again in terms of uh, fixed points. I like thinking about most of these optimization routines as just fixed point iterations. It makes it uh, very easy to think about them. So, assume we are just looking at f x plus h of x and dropping the l plus f plus h. This suffices to illustrate my point. And I am further assuming that some constraint qualification that the sub differential of the sum is the sum of the sub differentials. If you remember from lecture 1, this may not always hold but we assume that f plus h, they intersect somewhere on their domains, then this will hold. Because, you know, this could happen that f of x is the indicator for some set x, and h of x is an indicator for some other set, and both these sets and these sets are disjoint. There is going to be no solution. So, this thing is essentially saying, let us assume that the problem has a solution which is not always easy to show. So, we assume it, because it is not easy to show. So, we are, uh, we, we are solving that. Now, let us try to play the operator game again. You can play many such games. So, you write the usual sub differential condition. I add x to both sides, as we have done before. Now, what? Now what? Means yeah, I, I don't know what now. What, what happens at this point? I want to essentially. What are we after? I want to use the inverse of i plus del f and the inverse of i plus del h separately, if possible. That's what I'm after. And then, as usual, like I said, when you don't know what to do, give a new name, create a new variable. So this is one of those tricks. So, we create a new variable which represents this part. Okay? We just introduce a new variable. Fine. So, written in other notation, z belonging to that set is the same as x belonging to proximity operator applied at z by just taking the inverse, inver, uh, just inverting that operator, right? Okay, so I put z to the left. And then that means this happens. So now you apply the inverse of this operator to both sides. So you end up getting this inclusion that x belongs to that. So that means x is equal to the prox of f applied to that. But this is not yet a fixed point equation, right? It is not yet a fixed point equation because there is a z floating around on the right hand side. But we are getting there, I think. So, we, we, we need one more idea to massage this into a fixed point equation. Okay, so, we will give it a name as usual. This is called the reflection operator. And this is, the name comes from linear algebra. Two times projection minus identity along uh, a line is a reflection. So, 
for convex functions what it really means is again just the algebra. In linear algebra you can visualize it. So, we create this thing called the reflection operator 2 times prox minus identity applied to z. And then we derive what is called, this is called the Douglas Rashford splitting. So, so far we had done this, we had introduced a new variable z, we just rewrite this thing as this prox. So, which is the same as, which implies that the 2 times prox minus z. So, 2 times x minus z is the reflection of z, right? Just the notation. So, uh, let us revisit what we had done. Inclusion, addition of x to both sides 2 times, introduction of extra variable. Oops, suddenly it was uh, h, this has become g. Sorry about that. Please uh, think of that as an h. Okay, so I wrote x is prox of f, just apply this inversion, apply it to reflection of z. I need to now somehow write everything in terms of z before I have a fixed point equation. But r of h is just 2 x minus z, so z is 2 x minus r, right? But what is uh, what's this? Just plug in the value of what x is. So, the plug in what x is, x is that. So, 2 times prox of blah minus blah. That means, z is reflection of f, reflection of h applied to z. Finally, z is on both sides and you have your fixed point equation. So, pretty uh, cool trick, thanks to Douglas Rechford. And in general, so what we have done is in summary, that inclusion is equivalent to those two equations being satisfied, that x should equal the prox of z and z should satisfy that fixed point equation. And then the hard work is now that we have fixed point equations, you need an iteration which generates a pair of x and z that satisfy those fixed point equations. And th that iteration, that uh, that particular algorithm is called the douglas Rashford method. And uh, it is a pretty cool method. It includes your, uh, the ADMM method as a special case. Showing that inclusion of how douglas Rashford includes ADMM as a special case was a journal paper in optimization because the inclusion is non-trivial to show, but it is a very general purpose method. Uh, it is a very useful method to know about. And some people find it, uh, the notion of reflection more geometric than the notion of proximity, even though it is just defined using proximity here. It works quite well actually. Uh, so, I am just rewriting it uh, for particular choice of parameters. It is written, it can be written as alternating reflections plus identity. So, if you have heard about alternating projections, this Douglas Rashford helps you write in terms of alternating reflections and the alternating reflection style method uh, many times ends up outperforming the alternating projection style methods. So, it is pretty cool methods to know about. So, final challenge for you. We had f plus h, but if you have f 1 plus f 2 plus f 3, if you have 3 functions coming up with this fixed point style iteration for them is still an open problem. So, nobody knows how to come up with a, a generalization essentially of this Douglas Rashford scheme, which involves reflections more precisely to 3 operators. Partial results are there on Borbine's web page. He has like by now 10, 15 papers on that, but all of those are partial results. But uh, it is still an open problem to come up with that. And you will see, if you write that inclusion and try to add 3 x to both sides, after that uh, it pretty much stops. Anyhow, so uh, I will stop here.
but I, I, I bundle the first two into one. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's actually a pretty cool method to know about. And I think I'll just stop here because it's 11.30. What I didn't talk about is this because I overestimated. Uh, but then it's OK to means that the last part is about large scale. Uh, I didn't rush to go to it because hopefully most of you attended Francis Bach's lectures and his lectures pretty much focused on this part of things. So, but, but I leave that uh, also in there because I think uh, next time I will not recap for you large scale problems. Uh, I'll directly talk about non-convex problems and I may refer to just one of the large scale optimization methods on the way. So that will directly talk about non-convex problems and stop talking about convex problems. So uh, yeah, so, uh, and if you have, you know, I think because I've run out of time, uh, you can ask me questions. Uh, we, so I don't want to stop anybody else who wants to leave now, but uh, feel free to catch me anytime during the day if you have any questions or you need any pointers or anything. Okay, thanks.